Hey everybody. Okay, I'm hoping this is recording. It says it is, so. All right, so um, I liked the Slack conversations. That was interesting. It was neat to hear about like the Apple Watch and those things. Um, I'm gonna go, I'm actually gonna open it up and actually read through it while, we're, while I'm here. So uh, a few changes, uh, just so you guys know what to expect. Instead of doing the second um, presentation at the end of the, or the second recording at the end of the week going over the Slack conversations, I'm just going to do this where I include them at the beginning um, of each week. Uh, it looked like you guys generally uh, somewhat interact with the lecture probably towards the end of the week over the weekend, which makes sense. So, um, so that way, you know, uh, we're not missing out on anything. And then there's actually something for me to talk about. So um, let's see, just looking over some of these responses. Uh, let's see, Mary, correct. The no nuclear power plants have digital control rooms that are at least in the US. Um, there are some plants that are field testing different systems that have been digitized, um, but not many. Um, let's see. No differentiation in appearance of any controls. That's actually a, a design purpose. Uh, they don't want cognitive tunneling and people overly attenuating to any specific single instrument. So that's why there's some similarities there. Um, and yes, reach ergonomic issues abound when you're comparing uh, male to female ergonomics, considering the decades that these uh, systems were constructed. Um, let's see. Yeah, the aviation shape, it, it helps to actually see them physically. I think um, when it helps you kind of place it, at, you know, if you can imagine different, uh, like different levers you've experienced in your life, whether it's in a, in a car or other things there. Um, Three-way communication is great. Uh, Zoom meeting where it would be happening to go on in the background. I think that that would be a uh, a nightmare, um, but um, well, I don't know. Try it. Um, do you believe that if there were digital panels, then it would create a vulnerable system? So that is one of the arguments is um, digital systems uh, have, you know, they can be affected in certain ways. So there have actually been some, there's been some work done by, by Sandia National Labs and some other um, agencies on spoofing. So, you know, it's hard to get into a nuclear reactor facility if you were going to try to actually physically affect it um, as a malicious actor. So what if they can, and, and if you can hack in, okay, but these are very large interdependent systems. So um, with many layers of fail safes. So, you know, could you really affect a lot there that would you know, cause a meltdown or depending, I guess, what your goal is. Um, but one issue that they've found is spoofing. So what if you can hack in, you can't actually affect any systems, but you can get into the display or whatever that data path is. Could you affect the data in such a way that the instrument reads an incorrect value? Um, and that doesn't inherently do anything because again, you're not changing the physical system underlying it you're just affecting what the physical system's telling the display board. So then at that point, that's basically social engineering. You're looking at, okay, what can we do to mess with the operators and make them take actions that maybe would uh, create a problem? Um, possible, definitely would require a very high level of expertise uh, with that plant. Um, like we talked about before, what, since every plant is so unique, um, having a fundamental understanding of nuclear process control wouldn't do it. You would need that on top of a very specific and detailed understanding of how that plant operates. Um, but when we have done some studies there with operators, um, it was shocking how fast and accurately uh, qualified career operators could find the problem. Um, when we had ran some, a couple retired operators on their simulator of their plant and spoofed various values, um, they were able to discover 
the spoof within five or six minutes usually um, at most. Um, and be just because of the cross checks and those things. So that um, shows that the operator teams are extremely resilient um, in that. <clears throat> and they didn't know they were part of a spoofing study either. So they essentially just would stop and say, hey, the simulator's broken, something's wrong because it's reading a value here that's impossible. So um, yeah, cybersecurity is a concern. Um, it's a big one, but, and there's tons of different angles there. You know, critical infrastructure, you know, affecting devices that might get into the plant, those kind of things. Um, but the, the physical aspects of the plant and those safety systems, um, there's a reason nuclear, I mean, nuclear might have a, a bad name in different uh, public image style things because of Fukushima and things. When it does go bad, it's, it's scary looking. But um, but it's incredibly safe for the environment and for just users, people on the facility. It's just a much better, much safer way to generate electricity. So um, let's see, Nathan, okay. Uh, yeah, signal detection theory is crazy and it's, it's everywhere. So yeah, the baseball player's a bat, you're actually right um, with how that works. So um, they have, uh, They've talked about it with um, with professional baseball players and stuff. They um, so because of the speed, um, they can't if they wait until they're watching the ball as it's traveling towards them. They can't swing fast enough if it's like a fastball if it's above ninety miles an hour. So they're actually looking at the picture, the not picture, sorry, the pitcher and their arm placement, shoulder placement and their hands, um, you know, certain pitches, you hold the ball differently. So they are looking at that. And then it, it is an instinctive reaction. It is, there's very little thought uh, because you just, the human brain cannot have higher order of thought that's processing that fast. So it is like a signal detection theory slash instinct style thing. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting from a sports science perspective. Um, and yeah, Gestalt principles, which we'll get into uh, a lot, I, and we covered them here, but we'll get into them when we get into design aspects and things like that. Um, just because of, it's a way to lean on one of our most powerful processing systems to communicate information and to communicate what we want them to do. Um, let's see. Yeah. and. Mary put in here about mountain biking. Yes, all that. Signal detection theory is crazy because it, it's all encompassing, it seems. Um, and I would also be interested to look into signal detection theory um, across senses. So we generally think about it with the visual system or auditory. What if one of the other is missing? So what if uh, someone is, is blind or deaf? What if impacts? And how do we see their signal detection theory? Uh, change. Um, like I said, you know, my bachelor's was philosophy. Philosophy of mind was my main thing. Um, and looking at, you know, one of the articles, I think it was Thomas Nagel wrote, what's it like to be a bat? And he's going into essentially perception via sonar. Um, but we actually have some information on that because there was a, a boy who lost sight in his early years, and it was Ben Underwood. Um, and learned to traverse the world via echolocation. He had a, a bad brain cancer or an eye cancer or something, if I remember right, that took his vision. So he started, he had visual system, he had visual memories, and then he lost it. So he was able to use echolocation, he'd make clicks and various things to traverse his world. Um, unfortunately, he passed away. It was an incredible story. If you ever, I think, I'm sure that. Dateline or all those shows did something with him or his stories, I'm sure, fairly well documented. But that's an interesting thing we think about. What, what is signal detection theory in that instance? Um, and that's a big one there. Um, and then, yeah, Jerry commented there about, um, oh, wrong click, about um, there's a lot of statistics depending on whose base coming up at bat, et cetera. Um, that's true before they get in the box. Once you're in the batter's box and you're waiting for the pitch, 
Um, again, there's just, there's not a ton of uh, evidence that people can process information that fast and strategize, you know, if they're going, by the time they get there, that decision is probably made in general. Um, there's obviously, if somebody gets halfway through a swing, they can stop. But I think that that initial trigger, you will see sometimes when they try to swing too late, right? But too late is a millisecond. It's not uh, something where you can start late and still be successful usually. Uh, bunting would be an interesting thing there. Um, so jump the gun. Oh, Nathan, you put on here uh, workload. Yeah, so that's one of those things, uh, Nathan, if you can actually, uh, I'm working on a project right now that's dealing with some workload things. So uh, that might be an interesting point for everybody to talk about is what is workload? Um, it's an abstraction, obviously. We don't uh, have a sense of cognitive workload. So what are, what? that's the important thing for me to think about when we think about workload in terms of the effects on cognition. Well, what kind of workload? Because to me, if, you're, if the workload's really high in memory task saturation, uh, that will have a different impact versus attentional or uh, sensory information and those kind of things. But, you know, that's my thought. Um, and the problem is it's a useful abstraction, but when we get down to actually break into um, the specific aspects of cognition, you know, I, I think it matters at that point when we're talking about human errors and just noticeable different style things and how, 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 what kind of a minimal impact can these things have and that will actually affect us? Um, let's see. Yep, so Jerry, you're mentioning here about teaming. So we'll get into teaming a little bit. I'm not a social psych person by any kind of training at all. But if you are interested in that, I would recommend reaching out to Todd Thorsonson in the psych department. He's an industrial organizational psychologist. So a lot of teaming uh, aspects or in group dynamics are big for him. But yes, uh, nuclear does have some, some things to say on teaming generally. Three-way communication is a great example of a teaming device. Um, and there's, a, there's some others, you know, plan of the days, different things like that, where you actually orient the entire team toward a goal. So um, yeah, that's an interesting thing about the watch too. Um, about that, that would be useful um, to see that, but um, okay, Luke, yeah, the Three Mile Island key locks, yeah, it's, that sucks, and yeah, I mean, it's, I guess it's, you know, not that, it's a great comparison because it's cognitive, that's, that's a thing that commonly will happen in nuclear, is people say, oh, that's not a good comparison, because if I mess this up, you know, death isn't the possible result. Um, okay, sure. But remember, most of the things you're going to do in a nuclear reactor are not going to have an immediate reaction. They're not going to have an immediate response from the plant. And it's not ever really certain what the plant's going to do in the moment. So they also aren't worried they're going to turn the wrong lock and it's going to blow up or anything like that. But um, if you did, then yeah, that would probably be different pressure and those kind of things would probably have an effect. Um, yes, nuclear control rooms are stressful. They are, uh, it's an interesting experience to be in them. Um, I tend to not prefer how they're designed, um, but I think I'm a little bit more picky or oh, a little bit more picky generally about my designs than other people. And they were process built for a very specific purpose. So as long as they satisfy that purpose, that's kind of all most people care about. Um, but yeah, it's the it's almost hard to do control room research because it is a giant mess of signal detection, vigilance, blindness problems. And the problem is you can't, how would you operationalize an experiment in that in, in that environment? Like how do you control that? Um, so that's why it's it's really hard. Um, Ron Boring and Tom Ulrich and Roger Liu primarily did the initial research in the Human System Simulation Laboratory. So they'd have the best uh, information for you on how to uh, kind of get how they got through that. That's very well documented in tons of studies and reports too. 
But, um, but yeah, that is a struggle. Um, qualitative research ends up being extremely important at that point um, and just having really good participants. So um, auditory cues are big in nuclear control rooms. I'm trying to think back um, to the alarms that I've heard. I have heard alarms out of two simulators, the Sharon Harris plant simulator and Palo Verde's um, generating station simulators. I do not think the alarms are different, but I could be wrong. Um, the ones I heard were not. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean you wouldn't have separate ones, but the problem is they generally won't do that because of, um, you know, you don't want competing alarms. What if you have two at the same time? Then what's the point of having any, you know? But there were, there has been some work, uh, some kind of somewhat renewed interest here at the lab about alarm work um, with some of the other groups in the department. So if you're interested in that, let me know and I can uh, send you over there. But uh, sounds the plants have to memorize. That is not what they do, but um, an interesting, here, I will go back. Let me see if I can find, let me see, where was that control board? Is it this thing? Yes. Okay, so I will try to draw on here. See these little lights? Right there. Oh, that looks, that's, yeah, you can totally see that. Jeez. Okay, let's try this again. And I'll have to fill it in or unfill it, I guess. And here we'll do And we will blow up this red, big, so you can kind of see what I'm pointing out. Sorry about this. It just takes a second. Um, wait, there we go. Boom. Okay, so if you guys can see these little little light up things, those are alarm panels. Those are literally little tiny squares with uh, some text on them usually uh, to represent a specific alarm or notification. When they're illuminated, something's going on. Um, what they end up doing is they don't actually memorize auditory cues or anything along those lines. They memorize those, those lights. So they will actually memorize the layout of what those light panels look like. And they will know based on the shape of the lights, what's going on in the facility. Um, and, and what generally is, oh, this is going on. So that means, uh, you know, we're having a leak of this type. That is something they actually do. So when you get to that point, um, I've spoken with operators that will indicate when they get to that point, um, they don't even read the alarm tiles. They just tend to know this shape means this thing. Cause you know, cause the alarm tiles are, they're not random. So like, you know, you'll have your alarm panel for your turbine control system directly above your turbine control system. So you're at least loosely attenuated, but the, but the shape of it, of the lights and the shape that they make out will tell you kind of the specific details over time. So that's an, that's a weird one that they do do. So I'm okay, going back here. Let's see. Okay, again, gauge are increasing. Just keep getting on there. I know it's hard. Most of us probably work or otherwise busy, um, but it's really important, especially for some of the weird concepts. We actually have a good mix of people with different backgrounds. So going into some of those, uh, those points and watching, you know, having, your peers explain some of these points to you if you're stuck or whatever, or bring up those useful questions is, is good. Um, timeline wise, um, I owe some of you a new syllabus with dates. I have not forgotten. Um, I just apologize for that, uh, that I haven't gotten that yet, but um, start thinking about what you might want to explore for a midterm. We're still pretty early. And if you're not sure, we can set up like a one-on-one -on -one call or whatever to go over just asking questions or, I can help guide different thoughts, different things that might be interesting. Um, so, and with every week, hopefully you'll get a more idea. And I don't want it to be a stress thing either. I'm not wanting like a 40 page paper or something. Um, it's more just about demonstrating that you understand what we've been doing. If you want to design something, that's great. If you want to write a paper instead, do a presentation. Um, the neat thing with Slack is we can share stuff right into the Slack a lot of times. And then uh, discussions can happen below it, you know, in that thread, which is really, really cool. Um, so something to think about. 
Okay, so today we went through most of the visual auditory and some of the other sense SP stuff last time. So when we start into cognition, this first thing's primarily memory and attention. We'll get into some other things, but in general, um, that's kind of the main focus is just how we process things uh, or how uh, sensory information or stimuli comes into our brain and what we do with it. Um, the next step will be information processing and decision making. So, um, okay, so these are things to just kind of keep in mind consistently. These are questions to have in your mind as you're going into these sections and you kind of go through your life uh, the way you can think about things to put in the Slack. So cognitive resources are limited at certain key points in the process. So um, attention and memory are not, are extremely limited capacities that we have. So depending uh, on the process characteristics, you will have your resources be limited uh, based off of that. Automaticity heuristics can help us offload the burden. So this is when, uh, I don't know if this happens to you guys or if it's just a me thing, but when you'll you know be going through some routine in your house, uh, maybe you're getting ready for the morning or you're walking through your house and then you'll stop and think, how did I get here? And you don't remember opening a door. You don't remember any of that stuff. It all happened, but your brain has uh, built that routine so much that it doesn't need to dedicate resources to it. Um, that's kind of what we're talking about there. Those are mental shortcuts that we use. Um, so then if we're looking at those things, how do we identify human error traps and assess the risk of an action? That's kind of what we're looking at. Automaticity is great and helps offload your cognitive burden. But because of that, what if there's something that shouldn't be automatic? What if you go to lock your, your door and, well, for me, there's a giant spider under your doorknob or something like that. That would, I would have some problems there. Um, you know, we want to think about that too. We don't want to totally be um, on autopilot. And also, your cognitive resources are limited. So, hey, if, if this person's success or uh, on this task um, requires them to memorize, you know, 20 numbers, um, probably not a good task to try to redesign that one because some we're not going to do that very well. Um, that's when we get into design, designing for the human. Um, this is the cognitive side of kind of our ergonomics discussion we have. And can a human be nearly guaranteed to fail? So I take the approach that unless the human's like not physically there in a, if there's a button that needs to be pushed and no one's near the button, then okay, we can guarantee failure in various instances. But if a human has the potential to act, I don't think you can ever have 100% failure likelihood. Um, you could probably are pretty close though. So when we look at that, you know, is there any, are there any design designs that you've seen where it seems like they were guaranteed to fail? I talked about this briefly with like the literacy test. Um, that was a design that they were designing things that somebody would fail. So keep those in mind as we go through these. So attention um, is the concentration of mental activity that allows you to take in uh, a section of information from sense and blend it with memory and uh, just focus or attenuate that stimulus, that information. Um, so attention is the gateway to memory. It's the gateway to uh, any kind of recognition and any of those things. Um, it's been shown that it's relatively difficult, not totally impossible, but, but pretty near to um, handle in a cognitive sense, like process information without some level of attention. Oh, that was a duplicate one. Oh yes, I had written it in and then before I found that. Okay, sorry about that, same slide. Okay, so here's an example that they caught up listening to us. This is very old hat to most of the psych students in the class, but um, when this is a very common psychological experiment where we will play two different inputs into people's heads and see what they actually say. Um, you might think that they will garble them together. Um, more often than not, people will attend one or the other. 
Um, we're not very good at attending to things at once. Um, like, you know, you'll hear people say multitasking. It's one of the great things that have and has entered our lexicon that is not real. We don't actually attenuate two things at once, ever. Um, and so selective attention obviously is the dichotic listening. The cocktail party effect is one of my favorite weird things that we do in cognition. So um, people will notice their names in an unintended message. So let's say, and it, this also is, um, it, it's not just their names, but their name is just a big one that we can latch onto and experiment with. But so if you are in a, a party setting, you're having a conversation, and you hear your name in a conversation that you are not attenuating, you most of the time will recognize where it came from and what happened uh, in terms of just somebody said your name. That is a very common thing that we're able to do, which begs the question, you know, do we then code specific uh, alerts, let's say in our environment that we look for? And the answer is probably. Um, it also can happen um, where uh, if you've ever had this situation where somebody, you're not paying attention to them, they ask you a question, you look at them and say, I'm sorry, what? But then immediately can answer their question. Attention is not an active, it can be an active thing, but it isn't by baseline. So you're always attenuating the stimuli in your world at some level. Um, so essentially what your brain does in that instance is you are now getting asked a question about a stimuli that you weren't giving active attention to, but now you have to give it active attention. So your brain will essentially rewind and make sure you are aware of what's going on there and what, what you missed in that moment. Um, this is a very, very old famous image of selective attention and even outside of selecting for attention, he just challenges of attention. So um, the reason that we have selective attention is because it would be truly impossible for us to process all of the various stimuli and inputs that we will receive at any given point. Um, at any given moment, you know, you're getting the sense information from your body about where it is in the world. What are you sitting on? What's that feel like? What noises are you hearing? Uh, how bright are the lights, everything and anything. That all is handled by your brain. It's all recorded in some way, shape, or form. But your brain has to learn to only pick what's important in the moment. It's a survival mechanism that we have to manage. Um, and uh, again, if, if you're not aware, when I put in here, like, on and Trace in 1984. Um, that's a specific study that there that you can look up if you are interested in some more uh, detailed information. So um, perceiving an object tends to require attentional control or perceiving features. So a shape or, or various characteristics is an automatic thing. Um, so we don't need uh, attentional processing, attentionally focused cognitive processing to say that something's green per se. Um, so are we back to a filter theory? This is uh, the idea of, is there some barrier between our stimuli and our higher order thinking that is filtering everything? And maybe, sort of, um, I put on down here on the bottom, you know, I, this is something I still do constantly. If I'm trying to visually attenuate to a, an upcoming turn or something, I'm in an unfamiliar environment and I'm driving, I will turn the music down, which doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense with what we understand about auditory and visual processing. Um, but it's because of the higher levels of uh, the higher order processing that we're trying to execute there, recognition and some of those things. So feature integration theory, what's the role of attention in selecting and binding complex information? So what's that mean? That means that over time throughout life, we have learned the differences in similar objects in our world. We have learned the difference between colors of apples, caramel apples, candy apples, uh, apple the company and cupcakes that are designed to look like apples. 
Um, are they all apples? Yeah, sure, in some sense, but we also do understand the um, those mitigating factors, the intermediary characteristics and features that we're looking at. So this is a breakdown of these apple cupcakes. So this is how the features will work. And then uh, after all the, those features are processed automatically, it gets served up as an apple. So yeah, it matches the shape, matches the color. The brown bottom's kind of weird, but maybe it's an apple upside down or on its side. You know, that's the orientation. We're looking for edges that tells us shape and uh, gen general shape, structure, um, and where it is in the world. So then all that gets sent up. And normally that would be, oh, okay, what's the probability that's an apple? Given that information, could be high, could be other things. But then our visual system, so our visual system sends that up to our higher order processing and they say, okay, if all that checks out, checks out, yeah, we think that's an apple. Oh, wait. And we just pay a little bit closer attention and we recognize cupcake wrapper, we recognize fuzzy frosting or maybe it's shaved coconut that's colored, who knows, um, and those kind of things. So every one of these specific mappings has information about the particular feature, then gets aggregated, assimilated, and sent up for higher processing. Um, this is a little bit more in depth. So like I said, the, pro the features are automatic, so they don't have to be processed in a serial form. So um, we can immediately be aware of, uh, this has a bunch of pool balls in a, um, in a bowl. But then if we were trying to identify them on objects, you know, we see the numbers, that's because we could immediately see if they were uh, structured in this way that the image has, we can immediately see that there are numbers facing us. But to recognize each number in each ball, we would need to attenuate them individually which requires that. And that's how we get to object identification. Um, distractor conditions. So this is, and a lot of these are very foundational psychological experiments that we do, or that we had done, um, and now we're used to validate different ideas. So if you're looking for the green tea, um, what will happen, and any of you who have ever looked at like a Where's Waldo book or something, the actual, the more of a distractor you have actually decreases their overall distraction potential. Um, your brain ends up being able to blur most things together. It'll actually increase the likelihood or I should say decrease the time it will take you to find the thing you're looking for. But it's still pretty tricky when you're, all you're looking for is a, when your target has things in common with the distractors, that also increases that time. Um, now, feature conditions. So, one thing to think about here: uh, a blue, a green S is what we're looking at here, um, or a blue letter. So, we're looking for either of those. Um, and we found you can find the S pretty fast because um, what do we perceive first with visual systems? It's a lot of. Um, let me see here. Hold on. Sorry about that. Let me see. I had a package that shown up Dad. here. All right. Life with toddlers working from home, right? Okay. Let me pull up the slides again. Oh, it didn't say where we were. Okay. Distractor conditions. There we go. Okay. Anyway. All right, so when we're looking at this, the S as a shape stands out. So we can recognize it generally pretty fast. Um, similarly, when we have a color that is distinct from the distractors, the distract distractors lose their force because automatic processing will help us uh, pop that out immediately. So these are breakdowns of different, so the features being absent or the features being present um, and then with conjunctive searches. So um, the number of distractors, as you can see, tends to have a flatter curve on the um, on the features. 
uh, aspect. And then, uh, but we do still see with, sorry about that, except with conjunctive searches. Um, so if the processing is parallel, there'd be no effect. That's what you're seeing by the future absence and present. Um, and this is also a big indicator of bottom-up processing. So when the sensory stimuli we're getting is governing our processing. Then if we look up here, um, so if the feature is present, rapid searches, very bottom-up. If it's absent, then it requires our focused attention. So then we're searching at that point. Um, Remember, initially, that automatic perception does not require search. We perceive all things at that time, um, at least on that low-level perceptual processing. Then, um, and this is showing in another, on the other side, so we're looking at, okay, if we have conjunctive search, uh, or sorry, if we have um, the conjunctive search is absent, then, if it's if it's just feature absent. So then it's in a parallel search, it still takes longer to decide whether it is there or not. Yeah, so that is one also that I'm sure everybody's dealt with when you get hand, and this is something me and you cool psychology PIs will sometimes make you do, where we will say, okay, you have to find the X, and then there is no X. And you'll and I know me, I'm a lot of, a lot of time I'll be like, ah, it's gotta be here somewhere. Uh, missing pieces in the Ikea bookshelf or something like that. It's, it's gotta be here. As they said, it's here. Um, so sometimes we'll uh, figure that stuff out too. So the conclusion with some of these was that attention is needed so the relevant features can be glued together to form an integrated object, uh, which fits with what the research was showing. So how does this work in nuclear? Are we looking at features of various displays or instruments? Um, or is each instrument representative of a feature of a system? Or are we assembling the instruments together into an object and attenuating them? Um, think about how that works with like those alarm tiles. Um, you know, technically each of those alarm tiles is distinct and is communicating different information. So, but it also is a feature of a broader alarm state. So as you can see, this stuff can, can get messy and can be aggregated, aggregated up or down to have different conclusions and different things. And these are all aspects we have to be aware of when we're designing tasking for these things or displays or products. Okay, so working memory. Um, the middle three boxes there, we'll get into a little bit more. Um, probably next week, I think is when, I don't think we'll get there today, but maybe. So, um, but those are three different processing scores um, there. So the central executive um, is where everything's going to um, start there. And then we're going to, as we actively process through our working memory, we, each one of those, the phonological score, the episodic buffer and the sketch pad have different capacities, different characteristics um, that then feed back to the central executive. Um, and they also interact down below there. Phonological stores primarily linked with language, auditory indications, episodic long-term long memory. Um, that's really useful for schema processing and different things. And the sketch pad is for visual semantics. Um, that's how we will identify differences in our visual world. At this point, when we're looking at working memory, this is by and large attended stimuli. Keep that in mind. So, with executive control, working memory is required for any goal oriented decision making because um, you have to attenuate and specific, specify the task specific information that you want to keep in your mind to get the goal done. Uh, that is also another thing that you have to comply with capacity constraints. So it, let's say you your task specific information requires some uh, different sets of numbers or information that may um, outstrip your working memory capacity. Okay, well then you have to um, negotiate that and you may be switching between that task specific information, uh, especially in an information rich environment like nuclear, that could be a problem in your design. 
Uh, interference is another big one. Uh, working memory is prone to interference, attentional interference, or long-term memory interference. So it can actually interfere with you know, the memories. I will say the different memory stores can interfere with each other in some pretty key ways. Um, so you need to, you know, relying on memory isn't uh, ever really a good thing for design. Um, sometimes people ask, you know, what are the constraints? Well, there's a, a decent graph for visual and verbal working memory. We have that are processed independently. Um, uh, obviously at max there's, you know, in your teens to late teens to young adulthood, and you're going to top out about five or six. Those are unique chunks of information. Um, and they can manifest in different ways. They could be five or six numbers, uh, depending on how well practiced it is. It could be five or six uh, concepts, but you're gonna have hard, with the complexity of each chunk, uh, it's going to have an effect on the capacity you have, so. Schemas, schemas are one of my favorite things. So um, you have slots and you have attributes within your schemas, so, uh, a schema is your brain's preconceived notion about a thing, a place, a situation, an experience. Um, it's how we know to get in line at the store and those kind of things. Um, it's how we know the difference between a car and a truck. You know, if someone asks you what that difference is, you can explain it, uh, but you'll probably break down at the end. You'll probably have some issues getting at what is truckness and what is carness. Um, you know, it, it's not wholly exhaustive, those lists, and they also are extremely subjective. Remember, all of our internal information is subjective. We experience everything from our own perspective only. Um, so this is, again, a famous uh, image from a psychological research study. So they would show people this image, and then what would you remember? Um, you know, people would remember the chair, the desk, etc. Well, why? Because that probably fits a schema of an office. You would expect a chair and a desk. Oh, look, there's shelves there. They falsely remembered books. Again, it's an office and there's shelves. I think we all have a schema there that would probably fill that in with books most of the time. Um, but that, oh, that also shows the fallibility of some of those aspects. So it's important to keep an eye on that. This is also partially where, um, you know, memory is representational and it is um, post-processed. So, uh, and they, it's also not distinct. That's the other thing to keep in mind. Memory objects are not necessarily distinct from other ones. So if you have two similar schemas, they might blur and blend. We, we see that a lot with um, when you have, uh, oh my God, why am I blanking? Eyewitness accounts and then they come back after the fact and the story changes. It's not that they're lying, it's that memory doesn't work that way. We don't remember specific things hardly at all. Um, our cognitive processing and our survival processing was around remembering instances that were dangerous or instances that were problematic for us, not what color something was in that instance. Um, I hope that makes a little bit more sense there. Um, so it's important to just keep that in mind, especially when we're designing things or, you know, in nuclear, you're writing procedures or processes. You can't, um, you know, we talked about can humans be guaranteed to fail? If you rely on their memory um, because your design is not sophisticated enough to, or not tested well enough or designed well enough to be able to give them recognition of situations versus having to remember things, pull from past experience, you're right for problems. Um, you're just gonna have issues. Nuclear avoids that in some ways by using heuristics, automaticity, um, procedures, and just extremely high training requirements. Um, most operators have to spend, you know, tens or hundred plus hours a year in the simulator. They are constantly practicing these things. Um, in addition to their underlying information about how the plant works and how it fundamentally responds um, and how delicate it is for certain operations, 
they also were practicing things constantly. So that's a way you can sometimes get around that. Um, but again, I would contend that maybe things in nuclear wouldn't be so difficult if we just designed them better from the start. Maybe we wouldn't have to train everybody for months and months before we could do that. Um, and a little bit of time left, so we'll get into the information processing a little bit. Um, and so this is very important for as we're designing for humans. So, um, oh, that's a great, wonderful formatting adjustment there. So uh, I like this analogy with a computer. So think about this when you're trying to um, understand how our memory is working. So when we encode a memory, you're, imagine you're typing it into a database through a keyboard, uh, you're storing it onto a hard drive, and then when you retrieve it, you're navigating to that file and opening it up. And remember, anytime we have to access that memory, a lot of working memory um, access is um, subconscious. It's automatic and it's kind of closest fit and measuring, you know, okay, I am in this instance. Do I have a matching instance? No. Do I have one that's close? Okay. And then it's retrieving that generally automatically. But there's interference and breakdowns that can happen at every step of those arrows. Oh, they all went bad. Okay. Well, then we'll just finish this one and then I'll fix the others for next week. So human information processor. This is a uh, uh, a big early um, understanding of how we function. This was kind of a, right at the beginning of the computing age. Uh, I think it's 80s or so. So we had an understanding of how computers worked and thought, well, this might be a good analog for uh, humans. And it's not altogether wrong. Um, and there's definitely some merit to it and some things that we can take away. So you get environmental input, that's your stimulus um, for a computer, that's your inputs or different inputs from the system. You have various sensory registers. So you've got visual, auditory, haptic, um, any of your taste, smell, I mean, lots of different sensory information. That then will hit your short-term memory and your temporary working memory, which is looking at if you need to rehearse it. So that's control processes. So when we, uh, you know, when you're trying to remember a phone number or something, that's not really something we do much anymore. But when you're trying to remember, a number, you know, you'll rehearse it. By rehearsing it, you're giving it a greater chance to actually be encoded into long-term memory. That's one of the steps we'll take. And also retrieval strategies. And then a lot of times at that point, there is a chain for response. So there's a lot of things that we go through in our life that we don't need higher order processing or any kind of, uh, cognition at that stage to uh, respond to. You touch something hot, your arm pulls it away. Um, you know, you have some things where your body, your brain just responds. It gives the output because if you have this stimuli, the sensory or, or sensory processing mechanisms worked on it in X, Y, and Z ways. Short-term memory, okay, we did these operations on it. Here's your result. Um, and then if needed, it can get, um, it will, can get encoded into a permanent memory. Okay, this one's not broken, so we'll go through sensory memory too, sorry. So yeah, we have sensory input, then to attention, and then you have your storage and retrieval background. Um, this kind of just covers what we went through a little bit, but um, I wanted to go into here. So visual and auditory memory. This is your sensory memory store and it will delete it the second it doesn't need it. Um, in the sense of it will not keep attending to it and will move on. So for visual memory, you have less than a second that it's in there. If it's not important, it just gets thrown aside. That's why when we're doing those routine interactions, we see all those steps, but we don't need them because there's no new information. Oh. I, I did this particular step in the routine. I've done it a thousand times. Oh, and there's nothing different about it. So it, it's fine. We can check it. Echoic memory auditory is a little bit longer, um, likely derived from a survival mechanism. I'm guessing um, that's always been my thought is our auditory memory, because um, humans um, 
don't have very good eyes uh, in the animal kingdom. We're actually uh, with pretty bad vision relative to other creatures, but we do pretty good with auditory processing. We have pretty good hearing. So I could see that being why that stuff happens. Remember a lot of these, these just instinctive unconscious behaviors are encoded through evolution and years of that kind of research, rehearsal. So uh, keep that in mind there. And I think we'll stop there for the week. It's actually right about an hour. Um, I don't really like doing longer than an hour, but um, you know, again, if anybody is really loving the tones of my voice, I guess, or anything, let me know. But um, when I was in school, that was about the perfect time. So um, we've covered a lot of different stuff, put some questions out there for the Slack. Um, again, just kind of mention what matters, what caught your attention. Um, and if it is helpful, to where we could schedule a just kind of Zoom call. Um, I know somebody said that might be good. If anybody else is interested in it, that's good. We can do that. Or um, honestly, the Slack, when we really use it, uh, at least kept me more engaged than when I had regular class evenings. So I think that that's a useful thing. So um, yeah, that's it, I suppose. So uh, I'll talk to you guys on the Slack and we'll go from there. Thanks, everybody. Have a good week.